Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs. Welcome back to Decidedly Vanilla. It's episode, oh gosh, what even episode is this? Seven, eight, nine, somewhere in the single digits still. Anyway, that's that's fine. We've been working on the house a little bit. We've been doing a little bit of stuff off camera. I say a little bit, I mean a lot of stuff. This house has taken a lot of work to put together to the specifications that I had in mind to the details I required and it's come together super well. You'll notice that Rumi is out of his safety box. More on that in a second but I've managed to get most of the top floor done give or take part of the ceiling on this side and around the back I have completely taken out the lava lake. I've actually managed to get this whole thing sort of taken up and it's mostly been used as fuel. Some of it I did turn into obsidian because I want to build nether portals at some point so I need obsidian and it was just convenient and the rest of it is all in here in buckets so that's super useful. It's going to be great to have that as a fuel source later on. For all of the smelting we're going to be doing because we're going to be doing a lot of smelting I imagine in the future I need to go and get some more, some more quartz from the nether because I need to make more daylight sensors to go in the ceiling. I've been using an awful lot of these and they take up a lot of resources. It's slabs, glass and quartz. They take an absolute ton of. But yeah this is how the interior of the house is looking. A little bit more progress since you last saw it. Up here we've got a kind of landing space. There's going to be flower pots and all kinds of stuff around. I need to go out and get myself some clay at some point but in here we have what's going to be my room and it's looking pretty open plan right now I absolutely love this window the trap doors like that I've used trap doors absolutely freaking everywhere in this build as I'm sure you guys will have seen but I just really like this as a window I've got several different styles of window and here we've got these nice kind of open ones but I didn't want the entire thing to be open like this you want a little bit of privacy don't you so we have these slightly more narrow windows with the detail in front of it so you kind of can't really see through those but you can see out of them pretty well uh, you can't see through them from the opposite side is what I mean and the trapdoor one here was just kind of thrown in at the last minute but I really like the way it came together I think that looks super nice it's almost like you have a balcony kind of thing except you don't because you can't walk through trapdoors like this and I tried putting the trapdoors on the top half of the block and you can't even crouch to get through those it's just too little height for you to get through even though the crouching actually makes you able to travel through smaller spaces now which is kind of cool the floor in here was a bit of a compromise. I don't really like the fact that you have to step down to get through this door. It's not that great in terms of flow, but if you take up this any of the slabs on this floor then there's daylight sensors underneath and I didn't want to have to deal with that. So out here we have a balcony which I was considering putting a pressure plate there but then I'd just activate it pretty much every time I came out of that room so it's not necessarily where I want to go with it. But this little balcony, I could do anything with this at this point, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it ultimately but it is kind of nice to have this and it's nice to have a view over towards the rest of Farhaven to where my Pueblo buildings are multiplying. I've built a couple more, a couple into the side of the cliff up there just as additional kind of little spaces to work in. I don't have plans for those yet that one there still doesn't have anything in that one there is new and doesn't have anything in and that one there those are all just facades basically and that one there is a complete building but doesn't have anything in it doesn't really have a purpose at this point i'm gonna head over into Rumi's room because i need to sleep but yes we have iron doors there just to keep out the zombies because Rumi is free flowing now or at least he's taken up residence in this little minecart which i'm using to keep him safe just in case anything happens to get in here he'll probably be a sitting duck but i think the iron doors will keep out the zombies and if he's just left to roam around which was my intention initially the fact that i've used doors as part of the decoration here meant that he just walked out here dropped over down there to the ground and took a bit of fall damage and I don't want this guy to die because he has two mending books so I could just keep him cooped up in a safety box if I wanted to but I just like the idea of him being a little more free roaming so for now he's got a minecart that he travels around the room in if he wants to come and say hello to you at the door he can kind of wheel his way over here and the fact that entities can kind of control minecarts and boats when they're in them to a certain extent or I think they can control boats I'm not sure if they maybe took that out of the AI but Rumi will happily just kind of go back and forth on this track of his own accord he's probably not going to do it now because he's like i'm on camera i'm camera shy but he will actually go back and forth and you kind of saw it in the introduction he'll move around off his own accord without me even having to push him there's no activator rail there's no uh whatever it is the powered rail it's not pushing him around at all that's entirely of his own volition so i've been doing a bunch of trading as you can tell by the amount of emeralds we're going to get ourselves another mending book today because i feel like 
getting a stash of mending books together, especially now Rumi is out of his little safety box. I feel like we should probably take advantage of this while we can. Mending book for 18 emeralds, you guys. It's so nice. I've seen people on the subreddit who have mending books tradable for like five or six emeralds or something. I'm pretty sure the minimum you can have is five, but that's that's a sweet deal. That's pretty good. There is really no correlation between the enchantment that they have on the book and the number of emeralds. It's purely random and it's absolutely brilliant when you can get an awesome trade like that. One of the other things, I really like the way this window came together as well by the way. I didn't want to completely make this closed off but I also didn't want to make it the glass border like this so I did a bit more patterning. There he goes, look at him go. <laughs> Rumi the traveling villager. Uh, he's got a, a window like this with fences and fence gates just kind of like the rest of the detail i've done on the house and it kind of matches the back door that's down here the kind of entrance out to what's going to be the backyard and i really like it i think it came together really well super happy with the way this has come together kind of in fitting with the theme that i want to go with one other thing that i've added in is hay bales and if you guys will remember this from the snapshot video i did or perhaps this is just something you know anyway hay bales now prevent full damage to a certain extent they they absorb 80 percent of the full damage you would take leaving only 20 percent of the damage and that's been kind of useful for me because i still don't have a feather falling book to add to my diamond boots and you'll notice i'm keeping a lot of levels in stock right now i have 35 down there could potentially use those to enchant some other stuff but whilst i've got a mending book from this guy i've kind of been hoarding levels just so i can enchant stuff from books later on and yeah i, I need myself a feather falling book at some point if i'm going to be doing any work elsewhere but hay bales in the meantime are a great way of giving me a quick exit from this building without me having to worry about taking too much full damage potentially damaging my armor that kind of thing i think i might apply a mending book to my shield at some point as well because then I could have a shield that actually heals itself instead of having to keep making these ones. Which is why I've made it blank until recently, is just because I think... Oh, saw the cactus farm going. Because I think it's a kind of a waste to keep applying my banner to a shield, which is only just going to get destroyed over and over again. Because I've been doing a fair bit of combat in here. Got myself a little cow farm around the back here. I'm not going to keep these guys around for too much longer, but they're a great source of leather, which means they are a source of books. And the sugarcane farm is going pretty well. What I want to do today... I've got a couple of things in mind, but one of the things I want to do is to start on a backyard area that is kind of going to be walled off against mobs just wandering into the house. Because the whole, the whole layout of this place is pretty open. Like, if a mob wanted to get up here, it could. If a creeper just wandered into the house, walked up here, could easily get up these stairs, could be waiting for me outside my bedroom door, disaster strikes. So, what I want to do is get myself a backyard which covers... The back entrance here, probably, I might have like a gate in the back, just so I can continue out this way, but I'm probably going to move the sugarcane farm at some point. So I want a backyard that starts at this entrance here. Maybe it's going to be walled off with bricks and stuff, because I have a lot of brick blocks left over from where I was smelting them out of clay balls. And it's going to go all the way around the back of the house. We're going to have a lovely garden out here. Going to do some serious gardening work. And then it's probably going to come to about here where this entrance is. So I don't want it to be like every exit goes to the garden. But I think it would be kind of nice. I also want to put in like a little river or something. Have like water features go on, going on. Just kind of not quite be like a four elements garden. Because there's obviously going to be like fire and stuff around. We don't necessarily want that. But there was lava here recently. So I guess that's one of the elements was taken care of right there but yeah i kind of want to have like a, a garden that matches the house in kind of a chinese style perhaps i'm not entirely sure and obviously like red bricks aren't necessarily particularly chinese but you'll see what i can come up with i think i can probably make ourselves a decent garden out here and it will make this whole place look a little bit prettier a little slice of far haven so i'm going to be getting on with that and probably nip into the nether to get some quartz for the roof but you guys have seen the nether at this point there's nothing particularly interesting there yet apart from KB's tunnel to his tree farm, which is out there somewhere. So I'm going to get on with that. I'll see you guys in a minute. And welcome back. We've got a bit of a garden going on here now. We've got a decent brick wall. I've been kind of building this in a different way to how I normally build stuff. It's not a straightforward wall at all. And it's been a bit of a challenge because I've been trying to get it so that there are very few places where mobs, like zombies, for example, pathfinding mobs, could just step up like this and then get over 
this fence is kind of blocking the way here, but you'll notice that a lot of the time, if a mob doesn't have the ability to jump, which most mobs don't, they can only really travel up one block. And so the blocks here are kind of placed strategically so they won't be able to do that. Like here, for example, it could get up there. Maybe it could walk along there, but there's very few places where they can actually do that. And mobs aren't that great at walking on the diagonal. So let's, let's see. So for example, here, you could get up there, up there, and then up there and walk over. But I think that's, yeah, that's, there's only a couple of places where you could really do that. And I've been trying to place stuff strategically so that's less possible. Just so we don't have mobs like creepers and zombies hopping over the garden wall at night. And obviously it's not finished right now because I vastly overestimated or... Pay, no, no, wait, the other one. Underestimated, that's what I did. I vastly underestimated how expensive bricks are because... Oh, they're just so expensive. <laughs> I, I dug up so much clay, and of course, every block of clay is going to get you four clay balls, which means four bricks, which means one block of bricks. And so I'm going to have to find a clay block for every brick block I want to place in this wall, basically. And it's taking a while. So much so that I decided I would probably do something else for the rest of this episode instead of continue to make this wall because the garden will have to come together later on. So instead, I thought I would give you guys a quick guide to villager trading. Some of you guys might not be all that familiar with villager trading, and seeing as I have the perfect example here, here's Rumi, he's got out of his minecart once. So the minecart may be a problem in future. I thought it was going to be okay, but then I slept in the bed, I think, and then for some reason that separated him from the minecart and the minecart just rolled away. Entity collisions work slightly differently in 1.9, and as a result, you can't just roll a minecart over a mob to pick them up. They kind of have to enter it themselves. So it's kind of difficult getting this guy back in the minecart once he's in. I basically had to kind of trap him in. But anyway, here is how villager trading works. Normally, you start off with a villager and they'll have two trades open. They'll have one trade and the next trade, which in this case, very, very luckily for me, was a book of mending. Then each time you trade with somebody, with, with a villager for the first time... Hey, Rumi, come back. I'm trying to do a tutorial here. Anytime you trade with a villager for the first time, with any trade, it will unlock the next tier of trades, right? So each time you use a trade for the first time, it will unlock stuff. So eventually, you'll end up with a villager who has a bunch of different trades, some of which get you emeralds and some of which spend emeralds to get other stuff. Is the GUI going to close if he rolls all the way over there? Apparently it's not going to, but it feels really weird not facing him. So the idea is that you trade with them for resources... Uh, you'll get emeralds and then you trade the emeralds back to them to get resources and librarians are a little bit awkward because their main trade is paper and you'll need to get quite a lot of paper but it's an easily farmable resource right you've got absolutely tons of paper at your disposal if you have even a small sugarcane farm so <laughs> Rumi seriously you're going to need to pay attention if we're going to do this properly so I have now traded enough paper with Rumi that this trade has now become locked and it needs something else to unlock it and the way you unlock trades is by trading again basically so if you have something else that you can trade to them there is a chance however slim that it will unlock all of the locked trades again so if he's got a ton of paper and he doesn't want to trade paper anymore if i grab something else to trade with him now i have traded with him a bunch of different times so it's a little bit difficult to get him to unlock again but each time you trade an object for the first time it will unlock the trades again. So, for example, I don't think I've traded 11 emeralds for a clock before because, let's face it, that's not a trade you want to use all the time. You barely ever use clocks for anything, but that is useful to save in case all of the other useful trades are locked. So, for example, if I pop 11 emeralds in there, take out a clock, then it'll probably unlock that paper trade again, and then I can start trading paper with him again to grab myself some more emeralds. I'm not going to do that right now because instead I'm going to take advantage of the other trades that get me emeralds. The idea is to end up with more emeralds than you started with. So in this case, written books are a really good way of doing it because Rumi, the librarian, will actually trade you two written books for one emerald. And the resources required to get a written book are really not that steep. Now let's wait and see if he does anything. No, okay. Every time you see green sparkles and that kind of 
pink swirly effect. It's actually regenerating villagers' health when it does that. That's the regeneration particles. And each time it does that, that's telling you that the trades have just either unlocked, if he isn't unlocked all the way, or they've refreshed. So I'm going to make a bunch more written books now. And written books are a difficult trade to do if you're not quite sure how to do it. It actually took me a few tries to work out how you did this. But you start off with... A written book, any written book. In this case, I've just created a dummy one that says written book as the title, and it just says a written book. You create it, you sign it, so it says written book by Pixel Riffs or whatever your username is. And then what you do is you take it into a crafting interface, or you copy it in your, uh, hang on, in your thing, in your 2x2 two two in here. You can, you can do it there as well. You copy it with a book and quill, which you just make using a book and a feather and some ink and each time you get the written book and the book and quill it will make a copy of original written book and what you want to do is stack these up and they can be stacked in groups of more than two the trick is not to open them once you've got them because then minecraft does something weird and then it doesn't let you stack them anymore because it thinks they are a different object i'm not entirely sure how that works but for some reason it won't let you stack them up again and you have to trade them in stacks of two for a librarian to accept them. So in this case I can go back into his trading interface and I can even put them in here even though that's not the trade that is displayed, it's the trade that he knows for two written books I get an emerald so that's the trade that unlocks and he's just going to wander around the room for a little bit. He hasn't shown us any particles yet so that means that the paper trade is still locked and now he's locked the written book trade as well. Of course he has. So this is a point at which you might want to consider trading something else but you can keep the written books back for later because as soon as you unlock the next trade unless and as soon as he gets particles and stuff again the trade is going to the written book trade is going to unlock again. So let's try what I was the example I was given you before. Let's try trading a clock with him. If we just throw in 11 emeralds like that, and I'm pretty sure I haven't done this trade already, so if we get a clock off of him, obviously he takes 11 emeralds, particles, yep, there you go, and the paper trade's unlocked again, and so is the written book trade. So using this, you can actually trade a whole bunch of emeralds out of a villager over and over again, and each time use the trade again there is a chance that particles will appear and it will unlock again so see it's just done that with the paper one so that's refreshed the trades yet again meaning that the paper trade is not going to lock anytime soon and we can go through and trade a whole bunch of paper so that's how you get tons and tons of emeralds out of villagers now it helps to have more than one villager i actually have a couple over there in the lake but rumi himself has been trading me an absolute ton of emeralds just using that kind of method and i've almost already got a bunch of emeralds back off of him and all I need to do is farm some more sugarcane and I'll be able to get a bunch more that will kind of recoup the 11 emeralds I had to spend on a clock. So in a way you've got to spend money to make money, that's kind of the way it works out. But you'll notice over here at my emerald donation station, which we set up in the last episode, I've actually managed to fill up the chest to about halfway full now with groups of four emeralds and now altogether that's 56 emeralds that i traded just with rumi i'm pretty sure i managed to get them all from him so there really is no need to to harvest emerald ore by fortuning it as long as you have a villager around who can do the job he'll get you emeralds and that's how people end up with full emerald beacons it's just sensible application of villager trading it's really really cool and villager trading mechanics are one of those things that i really want to focus on a lot more in future for Minecraft because they're super fun and they can get you a ton of gear for very very cheap. You're basically getting diamond tools and books and really exciting stuff for free at the end of it which is a really good way of playing the game. It's very kind of sensible and resource smart and then you get to watch this guy on his little train track going around the room, which is kind of entertaining in itself. But that's going to be it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Leave a like on today's episode if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel if you want to say, see more. And I will be back next week, hopefully having finished my wonderful garden outside. I'll see you guys soon. Bye for now.